the shelves of our mainstream supermarkets, the fact that fair trade, even if we might not understand the minutia of it, we understand the sentiment of it and we understand the goal that it's trying to achieve. And I think a lot of the credit goes to the Fair Trade Foundation and certainly to Harriet and her wonderful team who will be recognizing later Jennifer and Faiza and, uh, and others. So without any further ado, I'd love for uh, Harriet to come up and say a few words and also introduce a very exciting new document which I hope each and every one of you will take away tonight. Harriet. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Good evening even, everybody. As the poster said, that's advertising, let's make this a fair trade Ramadan. Islam believes that people deserve decent working conditions. Islam believes that farmers deserve a fair price for what they produce. Islam believes in putting an end to poverty and injustice. And that too is what fair trade movement believes in. As you said so beautifully, we are like-minded and like-hearted. And it is taking those concepts of fairness and equity, mutual respect and consideration for others, and putting them into the heart of trade that is what fair trade is all about. And today, the coming together of those two strands of thinking we can celebrate today with the launch of the fantastic Islam and Fair Trade Action Guide that we're really proud and privileged to be launching together with Islamic Relief tonight. And it's packed full of information of the faith teachings on trade, on tips about how to take fair trade forward in your community, in your mosque, and in your schools. And one of the quotes from the Quran that is highlighted in there that I feel really speaks to the heart of fair trade when it says, give a full measure when you measure out and weigh with a fair balance. And it is that repeated image in the Quran about the scales and about weighing with a fair balance that is absolutely what fair trade's all about. And some years ago, I went to visit some cotton farmers in South India, and they had just sold their first half cotton harvest on fair trade terms. And so when I came into the village, they were having a celebration of how they had spent the first fair trade premium, that extra that farmers get for their crop. And they all gathered round in the village, hitching up their dotis and their saris and tucking in and having a ceremony around this wonderful brown paper package. And they very ceremoniously uh, cut it open and opened it up. And there was a set of shiny digital scales. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Why did you decide to buy a set of scales with your fair trade premium? And they explained that they are all tiny smallholders. They have really, really tiny plots. Cotton is their only cash crop on which they depend for all their expenditure throughout the whole year. So you'll understand that come harvest, they have run out of money. And so they go to the banks to borrow money so that they can hire tools and they can employ people. And every time the bank door is shut, slammed in their face. That People are not going to lend to small farmers, and that's a problem they face the world over because they're seen as too risky. That people, nobody wants to, to lend to those smallholders. And so they're forced to go to the moneylender. And the moneylender was ready to lend to them, but the moneylender was, was charging them 30% interest, even though it was just for a few months. And worst of all, they had to sell their cotton to the moneylender, and they knew that he was cheating them on the scales. And so the first thing those farmers had done when they had come together and got organized, they'd formed a cooperative. They had a contract from the company that was buying their cotton, a fair trade company based here in the UK. They could take that to the bank. And those farmers now can get a loan from the bank that goes into their bank account because they're now seen as a secure bet. And then the farmers had bought the scales as a symbol that they, the farmers, were in control of their own crop that they knew how much it was worth, that they knew how much it had, it, they had grown, and they knew the price they was going to get. 
And now that community, in the years since I was there and since I met them, have gone on to develop and strengthen their organisation. They're working now with hundreds of farmers. They're working bringing clean drinking water into the villages, improving educational opportunities for the children, improving the way they do their own farming. And they've gone from being a disparate group of individual smallholders with no power to change anything into a well-organised, thriving community. And that is the kind of change that across the world, now working with one and a half million fair trade farmers and workers, we're seeking to achieve. And we're going to hear later uh, about the difference that fair trade is beginning to make working with farmers in Palestine as another example of how, step by step, we can open more doors to more farmers across the world. But of course, we can only do that if more people buy fair trade. Because that story of the cotton farmers and the injustice they faced in their village, of course, that's just one opening of the window on the unfair world of trade. And that actually that kind of fixing of the balances and the constant undervaluing of people's products is actually happening at an industrial scale at a global level. If you look what's happened to the price of the coffee and the tea, the bananas and the jute, the rice, product after product that we enjoy every day, those prices have been in long-term decline, falling in some cases by 40% over past years. And behind those statistics lie, of course, more and more farmers pushed to the edge. And that's why we really want to encourage more people to buy fair trade tea and coffee, bananas and sugar, chocolate and rice, olive oil and sesame seeds, an ever-growing range of products and one of the greatest ways that we can take that forward is in our own communities. In our faith communities and in our schools, up and down the high street, talking to our friends and talking to our neighbours. And that's again what this guide is full of, tips about how we can take fair trade out into the community because that's what's driving fair trade forward in Britain and across the world today. It is a grassroots social movement of ordinary people like all of us here today who are talking about fair trade at work, in our community, in our mother and toddlers group or in our mosque, talking about the difference that we can all make to take fair trade forward. And one way is, of course, by how we have a scheme called Fair Trade Faith Groups and indeed Fair Trade Mosques. I'm very pleased to say there are already three Fair Trade Mosques um, two in Luton and one in Woking, and I'm sure there's going to be a fair trade mosque in East London very soon. <laughs> and perhaps tonight we can think more about what can we do. And then there are actually, I think, something like 1,500 mosques in Britain. Well, how fantastic if more and more of those mosques really took the principles of fair trade right into the heart of the everyday activities within the mosque, talking about the teaching and putting it into day-to-day -day practice with the fair trade cup of tea and the chocolate and the biscuits, using products, in particular fair trade fruit, when people want to break their fast, promoting fair trade during fair trade fortnight. And so what a wonderful opportunity to take this idea of fair trade mosques and to spread it further to fair trade Ramadan. And really congratulations to Islamic Relief, to Made in Europe and to Radical Middle Way for that completely brilliant idea of saying, let's launch fair trade Ramadan. And that can be a first step for many people towards getting involved in fair trade. Of course, Ramadan is a time for spiritual reflection and for thinking about the blessings that each of us have and how we can also help those who have less than us and how we can improve the lives of farmers and workers and we can begin to tip those scales more in favour of farmers and workers in developing countries, to tip the scales of justice. And you and I can do that every time we put on those scales, the fair trade dates, or fair trade bananas, the olive oil or the chocolate when we're breaking our fast during Ramadan. And so I hope that at the end of today you'll have a chance to go around. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity in the name of justice to sample all these delicious products, the fantastic dates, the beautiful olive oil, the coffee, the tea, the nuts. There's a wonderful range of products here tonight and how we can all think about together, how we can work collaboratively to put justice 
at the centre of our lives and our communities and to tip the balance in favour of farmers and workers in developing countries. Thank you very much.